Good morning. I'm so glad to see each and every uh, person who is here this morning as part of this assembly uh, together of like-minded faith, uh, choosing uh, to worship our Heavenly Father. I know there's uh, no better place for you to be than here right now. Uh, I know that the Lord appreciates that. If you're visiting with us, uh, we're delighted to have you. Uh, we want to invite you to come back uh, at any opportunity that you have. Uh, but we also want to invite you to stick around uh, and hang out with us for a little bit today. Uh, it is the fifth Sunday service, so uh, things are organized a little bit different uh, today. Uh, preceding uh, the worship service, we'll have our normal Bible study. And then after that, we're going to have a fellowship meal. And then this afternoon, our young men are going to lead our service. So if you have the chance, uh, stay in uh, Study your Bibles with us, uh, open up the Word of God uh, after this worship service, and then also stick around um, to fellowship with us and uh, enjoy some food uh, that's uh, been prepared for members of this congregation. As I was getting ready for this morning, I had prepared another lesson, um, another thought uh, that I had ready, and I was talking to Sarah yesterday, and I was like, you know, I think I'm going to change what I'm going to do. And the lesson that's going to be presented this morning is actually the lesson uh, that I presented uh, service, we take during this church camp a couple weeks back. Uh, so this morning, some of you who uh, were there, this is going to be uh, a repeat for you. Uh, but we know that uh, hearing the Word of God again, even if it's repetitive, it, uh, it's still going to be a great thing. We can't, can't speak it too much. We can't talk about it too much. Um, but I enjoyed this lesson, and I enjoyed the thoughts of this lesson. So I want to bring it forth and submit it to you uh, this morning. Uh, as well. If you want to, turn your Bibles to Matthew uh, chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. You see, in the Old Testament, <coughs> air, the Jews uh, fasted frequently. Uh, it was something that they partook in. They submitted uh, their bodies um, to God. Uh, they sacrificed food uh, to uh, focus on God, to worship on God. Uh, by temporarily choosing uh, to sustain from partaking of food. Now, we don't have any New Testament commandment that says, hey, you have to fast. You are required to fast. Uh, if you choose to fast, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, if you uh, consciously make that effort uh, to uh, discipline your body and partake in that. Um, but it served a purpose. Um, it served a purpose. And here in Matthew chapter 6, as uh, Jesus is speaking during the Sermon on the Mount, uh, he calls out and talks specifically about fasting, uh, beginning in verse 16 of Matthew chapter 6. He says, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, uh, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Verse 17, But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is, who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Motives are very, very, very important. Uh, I often say that attitude is everything. And here, Jesus, when he's talking about fasting, he is talking about the motives behind fasting. Uh, he says, see, you know, there, were, there were those uh, who were eating, uh, or who were not eating, who were fasting. And instead of using this experience to grow closer to God, uh, to get closer with Him, they made themselves look pitiful so that others would see. They weren't doing it uh, specifically to grow closer to God. They wanted everybody to know, hey, look at me, look at what I'm doing, I'm fasting, see what I'm doing. Uh, their desire wasn't to grow closer to God. It was for others to see them and see what they were doing. And Jesus calls this out specifically. Now, this morning I want you to consider a scenario, and it's a fasting scenario. If somebody fasted every single day, what would happen? Surely they would die, right? They would die. But what if their fasting went something like this? They woke up at 6 a.m., they ate breakfast at 6.30, they fasted until lunch at noon, and then they decided, you know, around 2 or 3, they were going to have a little bit of a snack, and then they fasted until supper, and they ate supper at 6 o'clock, and then they had a snack before they went to bed, and they started that process all over again. Technically, in between meals, they're fasting, right? Technically, they're fasting. They're not eating, they're not partaking of food, uh, 
So technically they're fasting, but they're fasting on a full stomach. You see, while somebody in that scenario could say, hey, I'm fasting right now, I'm not partaking of food, uh, they are technically right in that. Uh, we call breakfast breakfast for a reason, um, because uh, we are stopping that overnight fast. Uh, however, we know that that kind of fasting doesn't serve a purpose. It doesn't serve a need. Um, and if you say that's your kind of fasting and that's what you're submitting uh, as fasting, it's not really accomplishing anything. You're not really sacrificing anything. Your body's not going through anything. Uh, so it doesn't really make sense if you think of fasting in those terms. Hey, I've got a full stomach. I'm just going to fast between meals. That's what I consider fasting. And so we're going to examine this thought this morning of fasting on a full stomach. And as we go through this lesson this morning, I want, I want you to think about three different things that we're going to look at um, that uh, are required in our service. But examine yourself and ask yourself the question, Am I fasting on a full stomach? You know, is the service that I'm committing to God, is it really fasting on a full stomach? In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 2, God said, or Paul says, excuse me, according to God's word, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Of the things that you do to serve God, which of those require sacrifice? You see, those who like to fast on a full stomach like to give their service to God without sacrifice. They want to serve God in the manner that they prescribe, in the manner that they choose, without truly having to sacrifice uh, to God. We know to be a follower of Christ, you have to sacrifice. And we'll talk about Jesus' example at the close of the lesson and his sacrifice and the multiple sacrifices that he really made um, in coming to this earth. Uh, but you have to make a personal sacrifice when you become a Christian, when you bear that name, Christian, being Christ-like. Uh, we know that we can't just scrape by and attempt to get to heaven. Uh, we can't try to do the bare minimum. Um, and really, when you think about it, with everything that God has done for us, everything that he has provided for us, his word, his son upon the cross, and the ability to, for us to gain entrance into heaven... Everything that he's done for us, why do we try to do as little as we possibly can for him when he has done everything for us? Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. This is a story that most of us know, and, and I love this story, and we're going to talk about it here for just a few minutes. Uh, Mark chapter 12, we're going to read verses 41 through 44 of Mark chapter 12. It says, And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which makes a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had all she had to live on. You see, here we have initially, we're talking about the people who gave rich sums of money. Large sums. Rich people gave large sums of money. Uh, at camp, during one of the lessons, one of the men speaking uh, made reference to Bill Gates. And we know that Bill Gates uh, is super wealthy, worth billions of dollars, you know, the founder of Microsoft. Um, he has a foundation, uh, um, the Gates Foundation, or Bill Gates Foundation. Um, and the speaker made mention uh, that he gives away, on average, about a million dollars a day. Uh, that Bill Gates gives away. He just gives away a million dollars a day. That is a very, very large sum of money. A um, significant amount of money um, that I will never see in my lifetime throughout the entire course of my life, probably. Um, but Bill Gates has the ability to give away that much each and every day. But here's the thing with Bill Gates giving away that million dollars every single day. 
he earns more each and every single day off of the money that he has than what he's given away. He earns more than a million dollars a day, so when he gives that million dollars away, he's not really giving anything away. He's going to turn around and earn it right back. To us, that's a large sum of money. To him, it's not much at all. He, he has so much money, he doesn't know what to do with it, so he has the ability to freely give it, and that's a great thing. But when Bill Gates has given away a million dollars a day, he's not sacrificing. That's not a sacrifice to Bill Gates to give away that money. And that's kind of how I think about this when I'm reading uh, the first part of this scripture, when it says many rich people put in large sums. Um, it, being wealthy and well-off, it's great that they're, they're contributing a lot of money here to the treasury. But pointed out in the very next verse is something that's vastly different. We have the widow. We have the widow and her two mites. Looking at the background of the widows and why this is significant. Uh, in the time period uh, uh, that we're looking at now, uh, who in the family would have uh, been the worker in the family that would have earned um, the portions to support the family? Who would that have been? It would have been the husband. Uh, we know at this time uh, that the women were, were homemakers. Men were those that supported the family. Um, and so if this is a widow, that means that she no longer has a husband. Uh, so she doesn't have the means to support herself more than likely. And it's talking about she gives two mites, and the ESV translates that as a penny. Uh, through my research and looking, we know that monetary value changes over time. Um, so we know through translations you know, um, that value can change. But my, the best guess and the best estimate that I have seen is it actually equates to about 50 cents. About 50 cents is what the widow put in to the collection plate there, into the treasury, I should say. But the scripture specifically says it was everything that she had, all she had to live on. This widow, who more than likely didn't know where her next funds were going to come from, who probably doesn't have a means of earning income, is putting in everything that she has into the collection plate. That's sacrifice. That's also an amazing trust and faith, too. Uh, knowing that, hey, I'm going to give everything that I have, and I'm, I'm going to give it, I'm going to put it in the collection plate. may not know what's going to happen next, but I have the trust and the faith in God. He's going to provide, and I'm going to sacrifice because that's what I need to do. We see that the rich gave, but we don't know if they gave to the point of sacrifice that this widow gave. You know, when I think about this story, I think about what am I doing in my life that requires sacrifice? What am I giving up? And does it have to be money? Um, money is, and finances is what people relate to uh, the most, and we think about that. Um, but what, what things are we uh, giving up? Um, when we give uh, in service, when we give monetarily, are we giving to God everything that He wants, everything that He desires, or are we just giving enough to ease our conscience, to say, hey, I've given, I've done my part, I don't need to do any more, I've done just enough. We will probably never be put in the situation of having to die for our fellow brethren and our brothers in Christ. But we can still make little sacrifices uh, on a regular basis. When was the last time that you gave up some time that you wanted to spend doing something that you really, 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 really enjoyed uh, to study the Bible or to uh, work on a church project. Now, I know we just did the fair booth uh, this past week, um, and you know if you had the opportunity to, to serve in that, that booth. Uh, that's a project that we do every single year. Uh, you may have, if you're one of those people, you may have given up some time that you could have been doing something else to work that fair booth. You may have sacrificed some other time to be there uh, and to help with that work. But think about it. When was the last time that you, that you, you said, I, this, I really want to do this, but I need to set it aside. I need to focus on God. I need to do something for the betterment of the church. I need to sacrifice to serve my Lord. Yeah. Today, in our society... There's a lot of people who are looking for a cheaper brand of Christianity. They're looking for the easy way out. 
Fortunately for us, Christ has paid the ultimate price for us to spend eternity with him. But we have to make the choices and the sacrifices that reflect our love for him. John chapter 14 and verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, we're told that you have to deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow Christ as a disciple. When we look and we examine our spiritual service, think about your spiritual service to God this morning. When you serve God, are you doing it out of an obligation? Are you doing it out of a checklist? Uh, Are you doing it to serve maybe your own interest? Um, That I need to do this just because uh, it looks good to do it, so I'm going to do it. Uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with serving God on a daily basis. Uh, that's what God expects of us. But He expects that it should be intentional. It should be motivated. We should be driven out of love. It shouldn't be accidental or coincidental. So this morning, I submit to you, complete your service to God with sacrifice. Plan to serve Him in great ways. And I will promise you uh, that you will benefit from it greatly, and you will see your life improve for the better. The second thing is obedience with submission. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, it says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first command uh, with a promise. When you think about a child, and you think about a child uh, being obedient, being submissive. So I'm talking to you, all you members of the youth here. This is a good section for you guys. When your parents tell you to do something, what is your normal reaction to that? How do you react to it? They say, hey, go clean your room, go pick up your trash. Uh, I, need you, I need you to do this specific task, okay? Whether it's I need you to do this, or it's even saying, hey, don't do this. Uh, when they give you a task, okay, and they give you a command, how do you react to that? Here, uh, we have recorded in the letter of the church here at Ephesus uh, that you're supposed to honor your father and mother. It says, obey your parents. When you complete whatever task is being commanded of you, are you doing it with submission? Are you submitting to the will of your parents uh, as you complete that task? Or are you, are you being told, hey, take out the trash, and you immediately turn around like, I don't know why i got to take out this trash. Why am I listening to you? I don't like doing this. You can complete the task with vastly different attitudes. But when you complete that task, you should do it with submission. In Romans chapter 13, Paul, uh, writing to the church there at Rome, uh, tells us that we're supposed to be submissive to the authorities that govern us. Um, So we're supposed to be submissive to the government. Um, And I'm going to use this example because everybody hates taxes. Uh, But there in Romans chapter 13... uh, Paul specifically says, pay to those what is owed to them, taxes to those that it's owed to. Um, and he says, be submissive in this. Be submissive in the governor authorities. Uh, be submissive uh, in paying your taxes. Uh, submitting uh, to the laws of the land is difficult for me at times um, uh, when it comes to, you know, regarding, you know, laws of speed limits and such. Um, but we're commanded to submit to those governments, and we know that we're to do that as long as it doesn't violate the will of God or go against the will of God. And, I, you know, I think about these times, hey, when I'm, you know, I, I look at my paycheck and I see that amount coming out every single time, and I cringe thinking how much money is being being cut and sent straight to the government. But the Lord says, hey, submit to that. Uh, submit to them. If you have a job, uh, more than likely, you are not at the top of the totem pole, and you probably have a boss uh, who you report to. And you're submissive to that boss uh, in their commands. Um, when we think about the government, if we don't submit to the government, um, and we choose to break the laws of the land, uh, what happens? Um, if we break a uh, traffic violation, uh, we will have a, uh, it's not considered a criminal charge, but we'll get a ticket for a violation. Um, uh, if we break certain other laws, we may get charged with a misdemeanor or a felony. At work, if you're given a command uh, to do it uh, from your boss, uh, 
if you don't complete that task the way that you're supposed to, if you don't submit to that, uh, to your boss and you obey properly, what's likely to happen? Uh, there's probably going to be some recourse and be some repercussions. So we know that we have to be obedient. Um, with, you know, the, the, I don't think anybody's going to argue there. Um, but when we're being obedient, how are we being obedient? Um, how are we giving in to God? You know, when you come and you worship um, on Sunday, uh, what is your mindset? Um, when you're coming here, um, do you have the love in your heart for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Um, you know, when I, I think about obedience um, without submission, um, I think of people who decide that I'm going to uh, get the benefits of going to church, um, and I'm going to go through the motions of it, um, but I'm not going to do, do it out of love. I'm just going to do it um, because I have to do it. I have to be obedient. Um, I know that, you know, uh, we know God created us, God sustains us, and He wants us to love Him. And he wants us to submit to him. He doesn't want our life to be a life um, of a checklist of Sunday morning I went to worship service. I'm going to the Bible study. I stayed for the fellowship meal. I stayed for the evening service. I'm going to come back on Wednesday and I'm going to go through the same thing again. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, uh, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawless. You see, just like somebody who's fasting on a stomach that may just be happening to fast, that doesn't mean that they're engaging in an activity that's pleasing to God. That doesn't mean that they're doing the will of God. Here, Jesus says you have to go deeper. You have to dig deeper. James chapter 4, verses 7 through 8 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. There's three specific things here when it says admit yourselves to God following there after verse 7 um, that I think relate to submission and things that are essential to submission. The first thing uh, that we have recorded here says resist the devil. When you submit to God, you resist the devil. What does it mean to resist the devil? It means that you are doing everything you can to get as far away from him as possible. This morning I was listening to a podcast, uh, and they were talking about the, the sin uh, of Adam and Eve and eating of the tree. Um, and they were talking about, you know, what may have been, you know, their mindsets. And, you know, were they, did they look upon that tree? Did they gaze upon that tree? We don't, we don't know. Um, but it was talking about, you know, their mindsets. Did, you know, did they build a fence around that tree to keep themselves from getting close to it? We, we don't know. Um, but when it comes to sin, what is our mindset with sin? Are we trying to stay away from the temptations of Satan and what he's throwing at us? Or are we going to try to get as close to it as we can without giving in to that temptation? I talk oftentimes uh, with our young people here, uh, and I will tell them, you know, there's certain events or certain things that are going to go on uh, that's considered rite of passage, uh, that's considered normal, that's accepted. Uh, but also, you know, don't don't partake in those things. Don't go to those things. Even if you say, I know there's things that are going to go on that's inappropriate that I shouldn't be a part of. I'm going to avoid those things. I'm not going to partake in those things. But I, I, I want to go and have fun and hang out with my friends. And I'm going to avoid the negative things. But what are you doing when you put yourself in that situation? If you're going into a, a situation where you know that there's going to be temptation, are you fleeing from the devil? Are you fleeing from sin? No. God's command is to do the complete opposite, is to get completely away from it. A few years ago, I was in Columbia uh, for a weekend uh, for a conference. And one night we were going uh, to go out to eat on the town there in Columbia. And we were trying to throw out suggestions with the group that I was with of where we were going to go to eat. Um, and where everyone decided they wanted to go to eat was a facility that had a bar. Um, it had a bar and then it had a dining area. And everybody wanted to go there 
and one person of the group spoke up and he says, I can't go there. He says, I can't do it. Uh, he says, you guys know that I've struggled with alcohol in the past and I can't put myself in that situation. I can't go and be where there's a bar knowing that there's alcohol being served uh, because, you know, it, it, you know it's going to tempt me. It's going to get at me. We said, well, we'll sit at the dining area. You won't have to worry about it. We'll sit at the dining He said, no, I'm going to know it's there. You don't understand. I know it's going to be there. So we ended up eating at a completely different facility. But I think about uh, him all the time. That was a man who was truly repenting and he was fleeing from sin. He knew his struggles. And it amazed, he was willing to admit his struggles uh, to others, uh, which is a completely different topic. Uh, but it amazed me. He was willing to admit it, talk about it, say, hey, I can't do this because it's going to tempt me. He was fleeing from the devil. He knew uh, what he struggled with, and he wanted to make sure that he was fleeing from it. He was submitting to the will of God. The second thing here is drawing near uh, to God. These first two points go hand in hand very easy. If you're resisting the devil, what are you going to do? You're going to draw near to our Lord. You're going to draw near to Him. Hopefully every single day in our lives, <coughs> we're doing everything that we can to submit to His will and to grow closer to Him. And each and every day, uh, we learn a little bit more about Him. We grow more and more and more faithful because that's what He wants from us. He wants every single day uh, to be an increase uh, for Him. So by resisting the devil, we're going to grow closer to God. If we take the devil out of the equation, God's going to be there for us, and that's what He wants. And the third thing says... Cleanse and purify yourself uh, for God. The Pharisees were kings and queens uh, of obedience without submission. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23, uh, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe, mint, anise, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness, these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So here's the thing. Um, and he says specifically scribes and Pharisees here. Uh, the Pharisees were individuals that could quote the law. Um, they uh, could tell you uh, book, chapter, and verse if you asked them of it. Okay? They were very knowledgeable um, about the law. Uh, they, could, they could give you scripture after scripture after scripture. Um, and uh, they, were, they probably knew the law better than anyone else. However, though they could quote these laws, they could tell you all these things, their obedience to God was without, was without submission to Christ. We see them question Christ uh, over and over and over again, and they never submit to Him. Uh, as re is recorded through the Gospel accounts. They knew the law. They knew the Messiah was coming, but they didn't submit to Christ. Knowing the Word of God and being obedient is essential, but we have to do it with submission. We have to submit to the will of God. So the things that you do in service to God, are you doing them out of submission, or are you submitting to Him? And the third thing this morning... Is we have to have an outward appearance with inward being. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. <coughs> Again, this is Jesus uh, speaking to the Pharisees. Uh, here, just a few verses later. It says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the inside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. When I read that scripture, I think, 
what were they thinking? What were they doing? You know, how appalling is it uh, that these misguided scribes and Pharisees were acting this way? Um, and then I think of myself. And I think sometimes how altogether different am I from this verse here uh, as Jesus is speaking to these scribes and Pharisees. I think, do I try to put on the, the appearance that my cup outside is spotless, it's washed, it's unblemished, but inside I have struggles, I have sins, um, and I may not be serving God to the best of my ability. But I want to make sure that people think I am. I struggle with that. We all struggle uh, at different times. Uh, each and every one of us does. Um, does the inside, does your heart match your outward appearance and your outward actions this morning? Is the way that you're living life reflective of the heart and the love and the attitude that you have for God? Is the outside of your cup spotless, but the inside hiding self-indulgence? Are we going through the motions of submitting to God? And this goes back to the last point. But we haven't submitted to Christ as our Lord. Inwardly, is your heart striving to serve the Lord? We want to faithfully serve the God of heaven. But let's look inwardly for a minute, and we're going to close with this. I can't say that I have never been guilty of fasting on a full stomach. Um, that my actions uh, were not correct of uh, my heart at the time. Thing is, none of us here can boast of a life without blemish. Uh, none of us can boast about being perfect um, and never having mistakes. Uh, we all mess up. We all know that. And we can't undo those things. Nobody in this room right now is perfect. A perfect a person like that wouldn't need Jesus. But a person like that doesn't exist. We all need Jesus. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But even though we're sinners, we can all be saved because of Christ and because He's reconciled us to God. Close the 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God, making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Here's the thing about Christ. Christ sacrificed just as we're to sacrifice. And he sacrificed on multiple levels. If you had the opportunity to go to heaven and be in heaven, would you take that opportunity? Absolutely. If you were in heaven, would you make the decision to leave heaven and come back to earth? No. Why would you do that if you're in heaven? Christ stepped down and came to this earth and he sacrificed that to live on this earth as a man, to go through the temptations that we go through, and then to die death upon the cross and sacrifice himself physically again.
He did all of that because we have to be reconciled to God. We have to have a way to be forgiven of our sins. And as Romans 3.23 says, we all sin. And this is our way to be forgiven of that sin. This is our way to get to heaven. It's through our Lord and through our Savior. Are you fasting on a full stomach? This morning, as we get ready to sing this invitation song, consider those things. Maybe you're not a Christian and you haven't obeyed the gospel plan of salvation. Uh, We hope this morning that if you haven't uh, and you need to do so, that you will make that known. Or maybe you're struggling with any of the things that have been talked about this morning. Maybe you're fasting on a full stomach and maybe you need to be reconciled to God. The invitation is about to be open. Be reconciled to God if you need to. Examine yourself. Examine your lives. Submit to our Father with joyful obedience. Come forward now if you have any needs as we stand and as we sing. To prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing the first and second verses of number 328 after the pledge. It'll be the first and second verses of 328. Let's go. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this day thanking you for the many wonderful blessings of life that you give us. We're thankful for the physical blessings that you give us, and we're also thankful for the talents and abilities that you bestow upon us so that we can provide a way and means for our daily lives. And as we're commanded to give back a portion of those earnings, we pray that we may do so with joy in our heart in order to further the works of the church and extend the borders of our kingdom. This we humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this opportunity that we have to surround thy table. We're thankful for this bread which represents Christ's broken body on the cross of Calvary. We pray that as we partake, we'll keep in memory the anguish and the suffering that Christ endured while hanging on that cruel cross for the remission of our sins. This we pray in his name. Amen. In like manner, dear Heavenly Father, we come before thee now thanking you for this cup, which contents the fruit of the vine, represents Christ's blood shed on the cross of Calvary. We pray that we may partake of it in a way that will be well pleasing to thy side. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn will be, Jeremy, 708, if you're utilizing the book. If not, it'll be on the screen, I'm sure. Steve Harper will lead us in our final prayer for this service. We're delighted all of you are here today. We have no visitor's cards, but I know Kobe and Shirley Sadler are here, and we're glad to have them with us this morning. And uh, we are proud of any others who are visiting, and we hope that you'll come back and be with us every opportunity that you have. Uh, it's good to see all of you. We've been out of pocket for the last couple of weeks at camp and so on, and then a gospel meeting. 
but we're glad to be back home, and uh, it's good to see all of you. Appreciate getting to hear the good lesson again by Justin. Three wonderful points about service and uh, serving our Lord. That's what we talked about at camp, developing the heart of a servant. And the night Justin spoke, there were five responses, I believe, to the invitation. And I did notice one young lady, uh, I believe it was that night, uh, we kind of made a mess down at the uh, pavilion with, uh, you know, drink bottles and so on. We were encouraging them to drink a lot of water. There was one young lady down there who was picking all this stuff up, and nobody else was helping her. She was the only one. And I made mention to her that I appreciated her doing that. She said, I do that all the time at school, too. So evidently, she was uh, really practicing being a servant, and I appreciated that, and I think all of us did. Uh, Remember now, as uh, Justin pointed out, we'll be having Bible study and then a fellowship meal. Please stay with us for that, and then be here for the 1230 service. Uh, Matthew Jones will be speaking. Is he the only speaker? All right, Matthew, looking forward to that. And uh, then we're going to be doing the devotional service over at the Carthage Pavilion at 2 o'clock. Next Sunday afternoon, we'll have the devotional at 2 o'clock at Kindred. We'd love to have all of you to come and be with us, if at all possible, help out with the singing. Uh, News and notes concerning the sick. Kathy Stafford is in Vanderbilt Hospital where she was admitted last Thursday following a uh, motor vehicle accident, and uh, she has broken ribs on both sides, uh, uh, other injuries, and just uh, in in a body cast, a flexible body cast, and we hope that she is feeling much better. Remember, too, uh, Grandmother, Miss Dixon, Imogene Dixon, Leslie Alford, Scotty and Gay are here today, but to keep them in your prayers, Gary Lester, Ray Upchurch, Emma Hall, Bob Harville, Jenny Burnett, Brandon Powell, Josh Dillard, Earl Earl Carter, Frawny Rose, Karen Howell, and Francis Rollins have all requested our prayers. Uh, We have this thank you note from uh, my Miss Barbara. Thanks to all who sent cards and made inquiries about my mother and me. Special thanks to Patricia, Beth, and Gail for the food. It was delicious and most helpful. Thanks also to Risa and Derek for the gift card. Continue to remember us in your prayers. Signed, Barbara Anderson. And I echo those sentiments. That food was good indeed. And we enjoyed that immensely. Birthdays include Ann Carter on the 31st. That's today, I believe, or is, yeah, not tomorrow. Ann? Okay, she's having a birthday. I didn't surprise her. But uh, W.A. Gibbs and uh, Jordan Tungate will celebrate theirs on the 1st. Scott Cook on the 3rd. Cheryl Hicks on the 4th. Maggie Beth Law on the 5th. And Dustin Washer on the 6th. Chris and Amanda Hicks will celebrate an anniversary on the 5th, and Jim and Kathleen Rupp Logo on the 6th. So congratulations to all of these. Remember, our annual Friday night singing will be this Friday night. So uh, let's have our food here a little bit before 5. We'll start feeding folks about 5 o'clock, and uh, then the singing will begin in proper at uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, the sign-up sheet is posted to... Uh, if you want to help with food and drinks. Remember, too, to pick up Magi boxes for the children in Honduras. Those are available out there in the foyer. Uh, someone has brought one back already this morning, and it's down underneath now. The empty ones are on the top, but those that have been filled up are down underneath. So we, we really appreciate all those who are helping with that. Uh, any other announcements that need to be made? If not, thank you for being here. Let's stand for the closing song in prayer and stay for Bible study in just a few minutes. Sing the first verse and be dismissed. Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountain through the deep hell. Jesus has said,
Heavenly Father, we come to you giving thanks for this beautiful day you blessed us with. Thankful for the opportunity that we've had to study and come and worship you. Thankful for the country in which we live that we can assemble throughout the year. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for the many blessings that we take for granted. We pray, Heavenly Father, that everything said and done is been done in accordance to your will. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with each and every one of those that we just mentioned, that those that are in need of our prayers. And Father, we pray for those, that, especially this assembly here, that, that they need, need their prayers and pray that you'll keep a safe hand over them, over all of us, and bring us back the next point in time. We realize, Heavenly Father, that we are weak and sinful creatures. We pray that you'll forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.